Matthew, the 27th chapter, and I'll just read the opening verses. Can you hear me now? Let's have a closing word of prayer. Can you hear me now? Matthew chapter 27, verses 1, 2, and 3. Now when the morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him to Pilate, the governor. Friendship is a very powerful thing. And when we take a look at the passage that we will take into account, Matthew 27, we see the value of friendship. There are different categories or different levels of friendship. There's a friendship of personality, where the person has an amiable smile, has good jokes to tell instead of bad ones. They will actually make you laugh. And you enjoy, to enjoy just being around the individual. And it makes a little difference that he's a hired assassin for the mob. On the other hand, there's a friendship that's based on character. Where this is a person who has values, who has morals and ethics, and is reliable. And that friendship can deepen until it becomes a commitment. And one is willing to serve and to help the other. What I would like to suggest to you, that friendship has impacted all of humanity. There are three dates in history that affects each and every one of us. The day that Jesus was born, the day that Jesus was crucified, and the day that Jesus rose again from the grave. Every human life has been impacted by that, whether they know it or not. Without the incarnation, there would not be the crucifixion. Without the crucifixion, there would not be the resurrection. Without the resurrection, there would be no hope of life now and life to come. I would like to suggest to you that Jesus Christ approached Jerusalem as a friend, as a friend to those who are not friends to him. And I want us to be able to take a look at this crucifixion, because above all else, it's the expression of friendship to people who at the time did not want to be friends. And it's an expression of friendship now in our generation to people who do not want to be friends with Jesus. That's how important the Lord's commitment of love is. It is a friendship predicated upon love. And therefore the crucifixion is unique in that it is the offer of friendship to those who have no interest in being friends with God. Let me ask you, those of you who are here today and you're a Christian, was there a time when you could care less about the gospel? Was there a time when you did not care? Was there a time when you were aggravated by those Bible thumpers? And then some way, somehow, there was an interest that was developing, an interest that spoke an understanding of the great expression of love. And we want to see that expression of love and friendship here because Jesus faced overwhelming opposition. And Jesus did not risk, resist the opposition and he welcomed his opponents. He welcomed them as opponents. And this is what we want to look at. Notice first, in Matthew 26, verses 45 through 47. Then he came to the disciples and he said to them, 
Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays is at hand. While he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came up, accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs, who came from the chief priests and elders of the people. What I want us to do is to look at the overwhelming opposition and its extent. Notice that the crowds played a big part in this. Notice they were with Judas at the arrest, with swords and clubs, as though Jesus could overcome them. And yet they had that fear they were going to win. And even when it appeared that they won, while Jesus was on the cross, and those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself if you are the Son of God. Come down from the cross. Many of us who have been Christians for years have read these passages over and over again, but sometimes we would be well served to try to place ourselves in that moment in history and to see the open expression of hatred and animosity, to see the expression of cruelty while one is hanging on the cross. Here is all of this abuse, wagging their heads. You who are going to destroy the temple. You who are going to rebuild it in three days. Come on, get it straight. Save yourself and then we'll believe you. Save yourself and then you can go build the temple. If you are the Son of God, come down from that cross. And notice it wasn't just by the crowds. It was by the Jewish leadership as well. Now the chief priests and the whole council kept trying to obtain false testimony against Jesus so that they might put him to death. And they did not find any, even though many false witnesses came forward, but later on two came forward. The leadership, their intent was to kill Jesus. Their intent was to kill Jesus by any means, even if it took a false witness. It would be better, so that we heard, we read in the scriptures, it would be better if one man would die for the nation to save the nation. And the high priest didn't know how accurately he spoke. The overwhelming opposition. A tiny little band of followers who were so afraid many of them ran. And they were there at the arrest. They were there at the trial. They were there at the crucifixion. And notice it was by the crowds, by the Jewish leaders, and notice also it was by the Roman leadership as well. Then he released Barabbas for them, meaning Pontius Pilate. But after having Jesus scourged, he handed him over to be crucified. And then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. And they began to ridicule him. They began to insult him. This by Pilate. And this by Herod as well. Herod, who was the king, basically was set up as king by none other than the Roman government. And Herod, with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. Now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that very day, for before they had been enemies with each other. Notice the dynamics. But Before we get to the dynamics, notice one last group. The two robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Justice is not an easy thing. It is not an easy thing to find. It is not an easy thing to apply. It is not an easy thing to pursue. But there is one who wanted to be friends. And because he wanted to be friends, this is a small price to pay. 
And notice as we looked at the extent, it's overwhelming. We want to look at the dynamics behind that. And the dynamics behind this overwhelming opposition is historical and it is also theological. Notice in verses 20, verse 16 through 18. At that time they were holding a notorious governor or prisoner called Barabbas. So when the people gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For they knew that because of envy they had handed him over. Can you imagine? Stop and think for a moment. On this one Sunday, Palm Sunday, notice the contrast. Here came Jesus. Make, as it happened, the planning committee was a little late. So what was going on? People took off their robes and put it on the colt so Jesus could have something of a saddle. The others took robes and put them in the, ground, in the, robe, in the road before him. They had palms, branches. Compare this with some of the things that we know about the parade of kings in Rome, in Persia, in Babylonia. There's always a great show of power. There is always a great show of opulence. There is always a great show of some sense of sovereignty that approaches the divine. And here is Jesus, riding on a colt that wasn't his, riding on robes that were not his, walking over robes that were not his, palm branches, not soldiers, palm branches, not swords or spears. And he is coming in as the new king. Hail him, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's all we're going to see. That's all we're going to hear. But Jesus was the provocateur, was he not? Did he not go into the temple and chase the money changers out? Did he not challenge the theology of the leaders? Had he not done it all along? Before Abraham was, I am a clear claim to being the divine who was in the burning bush. He claimed these things. And he didn't mind challenging the elders. We can see the envy. But notice also the political expedience. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, but rather that a riot was starting, he took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to that yourselves. And all the people said, his blood shall be on us and on our children. The dynamics, the envy of the time. Notice the political expedience. It would be better to hand Barabbas over and crucify Jesus than to have a riot. And besides that, he got to be friends with Herod. Politically speaking, and for the Roman Empire, it couldn't get any better. But notice there is a theological element. And this is a lesson that we can learn today. The theological element is simply this. The Jewish leaders over a period of time had developed a profile of what the Messiah would be like when he would come. And that profile, Jesus did not fit. And rather than examining their theology to see whether it was right or wrong, instead, they decided that they were right and he was wrong. Notice they expected one to come with the majesty of Rome, with the majesty of the Persians in days gone by, with the majesty of the Assyrians and the Babylonians. But what happened? We had one figure riding in on a colt. And he had no majestic stature. For he grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of parched ground. 
He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. Picture in your mind, if Jesus Christ were to walk through the door today, conforming to this particular image, would he be welcomed here? James talks a lot about that, does he not? And notice that he was despised because he had no value. He was despised and forsaken of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their face, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Notice, we did not value him appropriately. We did not value him properly. We did not value him accurately. And the question again rises, who is Jesus Christ to each of us? We may have an image of Jesus Christ in our mind, but does it match the witness of God's word? That is the question that we have before us. He was despised because he was worthless. And he was incorrectly perceived. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried. Yet we ourselves are esteemed, esteemed him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the chastening for our well-being fell upon him. And by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. And because of their own theological conception of the Messiah, these things were overlooked and denied. He was incorrectly perceived. He was thought to be punished for his own sins, but that was not the case, was it? Instead, he was pierced for our transgressions and our iniquities fell on him. And even this day, we could go into certain circles and read this passage and it would be rejected, and we would be laughed out of the room. But the question still is, who? Who is Jesus to you and to me? And is this not the work of a friend who will accept our iniquities and the punishment thereof? But Jesus did not resist his opponents. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place. For all those who take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? As the sword was drawn in the garden when Jesus was being arrested, notice what Jesus said, put it back in its sheath. Don't you think that I have enough forces at my disposal that I could do away with this rabble in a heartbeat? He did not resist when he could have. He did not resist because his power was being directed in another way. One that was directed for you and for me, toward you, toward me, toward the Father. He did not resist his opponents, even though he was able to resist. He resisted in the garden, and he resisted before Pilate as well. And Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. He was doing a work that would enable you and me to walk into the kingdom in all of its glory and majesty and have the legal right to do so. Jesus did not resist his opponents. Jesus was overwhelmed. He did not resist. It looked like he couldn't resist, but he could have resisted successfully. 
And Jesus welcomed his opponents. Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. His non-resistance was an expression of friendship. Friendship to people who did not want to be friends. Friendship to people who hated him. And what would he gain by becoming friends with you and with me? What can I add to the glory of Jesus Christ if I were to become his friend? What could you add to the glory of Jesus Christ by becoming his friend? This is why it's so important to sing Amazing Grace. His non-resistance was the expression of friendship to his opponents. And while he appeared to be passive, he was offering himself. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days. And the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. This sounds like a reading out of another era of time. In our lifetime, we have watched our nation, we have watched Western culture deny that there is any such thing as the existence of morals and ethics, denied anything that says there is a universal standard of right and wrong. All of that has been done away with. All that remains is feelings. And if it feels good, it's right. If it doesn't feel good, it's wrong. Now we have our children going off to universities instead of being trained to think properly. Now we find out that they can be trained in how to be offensive and not to be offensive. We don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. There is an offense to the gospel. Who in the world likes to hear all have sinned and come short of the glory of God? Who likes that? Only those who have understood it to be the truth, who've understood that this is why God sent his son. This is the true expression of love and of friendship. And this is the story of Christmas, of Good Friday, of Easter Sunday or Resurrection Sunday, and of that great day to come. He was passive. He was in our place for our guilt. And notice that his prayers revealed himself as a friend. And Jesus answered. I kept forgetting to push the button, I guess. But notice in Luke 23. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing his garments among themselves. And what we want to point out here, that Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them. But in Greek, there's a little twist on the verb. Jesus was repeatedly saying, forgive them, because they don't know what they're doing. He said it more than once because he spoke the truth on our behalf. But notice that one embraced the offer. And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our death. But this man has done nothing wrong. He was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Notice that one of those thieves, one of those robbers, who insulted him earlier in this experience, now recognized what was going on. He recognized his guilt. He recognized the just penalty of it all. And he asked to be received by the Lord, and the Lord received him as friend and as brother. He received him as a member 
of the everlasting family. Notice this in 2554. Others believe it to be strong enough that what we see, the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus when they saw that the earthquake and the things that were happening became very frightened and said, truly, this was the Son of God. What we understand by this, some say that the centurion accepted Christ as the Messiah at that moment. Others say that he did not because the expression is too general. What we do see is that he clearly understood who was being crucified. And I find it difficult to believe that he did not embrace him as his savior. But that brings us to this day. I deliberately included Isaiah 53 because notice that Paul in 2 Corinthians gives to us a summary exposition of what the cross is all about. That God the Father took our sins from us and he placed them on the crucified Christ. And he also took the righteousness of the crucified Christ and placed it on us. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Notice what happened at the cross. The works of love and friendship. The one who was not guilty of anything received the guilt. The ones who were guilty of it all received the righteousness. That is the gift of love. That is the expression of friendship. And there is no other friend so good as Jesus Christ our Lord. And with this double imputation, we're not only friends with Jesus, but we are also friends with his Father. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. I focus attention on the term reconcile. I focus attention on the term reconciliation because it speaks of the ending of, so of hostility, the end of war, the establishment of peace, and in that peace there is friendship. This is the expression of friendship. When we became reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, he is not only my heavenly father, he is my friend. And Jesus Christ is not only my Redeemer, but he is my friend. And I trust that you can say the same. And notice that because of the cross, our time of unbelief and unfaithfulness is forgiven and gone. The old things are forever gone and the new things are here forever. If you are one who still wrestles with things gone by, they were covered at the cross. As the old time preacher said, they're covered by the blood. And if God does not hold it against you, why hold it against yourself? If God doesn't hold it against me, why should I hold it against myself? If God doesn't hold it against you, forget it if somebody else does. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away, and behold, new things have come. And because of the cross, we have the honor to speak of the friendship of God and to call others to become friends with the one who will be a friend who stays closer than a brother. Now all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, namely that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not counting their transgressions against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Friends, we live in a difficult time, but it's more like the trend in church history as we know it. We are called upon to speak the message of friendship. 
we are called upon to speak the message of reconciliation. To be able to live that life. And when it is such a hostile environment, it's more important that we step out with the expression of love, friendship, and reconciliation. But first and foremost, are you reconciled to God through Jesus Christ? If you are, welcome to the family of friends. In the Roman Empire, most families were held together by legal contracts. What Christianity brings to the scene is family that's held together by the strong bonds of love. And if we're a part of the family, we know love and we know how to accept it and how to express it. But first, have you embraced the friend who stays closer than a brother, Jesus Christ? Our Father, as we come to you in prayer, we thank you for those three dates that are so important in history. For everything focuses around those three dates. History focuses around that one man, Jesus Christ, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead and buried, rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven where he seats, seated at the right hand of the Father, and from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. Thank you for justice. Thank you for justice of the cross. Thank you for the love and the friendship of the cross. May we have embraced the cross in its entirety to know its life and its blessing now and forever. In Christ's name we pray.